I'm John Bowden. Here's our entire interview with former Utopia member, longtime Todd Rundgren collaborator, bassist for Bat Out of Hell by Meatloaf. He played with the New Cars, Blue Oyster Cult, Scandal, Hall and Oates. It's Kasim Sultan on Rock History Book. Do you want to hear a funny story yeah, about Monkton? Okay, so so we were playing in Halifax and um, and we had to uh, we had to we. We had to fly from Toronto and um, and it was like the height of Bad Out of Hell 2. And Meatloaf rented a, uh, we had a charter uh, and there was only five guys uh, that were allowed to, not allowed, but that chose to go on the charter as opposed to riding a bus or taking a commercial flight. In any case, it was the small Learjet. There was four band members and a tour manager, and, uh, uh, including Meatloaf. Um, and... Uh, and it was in the middle of January, an ice storm, and the plane could not land in Halifax uh, because of tail um, um, crosswinds, and it was very, very scary. We, you know, that we came in to land, and they're like, "Nope, we're taking off again. We, we can't land." Anyway, we wound up in Moncton. <laughs> we wound up having to fly to Moncton that that day, and then drive from Moncton to Halifax. Which is what, I think about three hours, two and a half hours? Yeah, oh, something like that, it. yeah. So it's called 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know what, there's not a bad, I mean, I, 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 the Nick Lowe, you know, the last song, I, I, I knew the song from Elvis, Costello, but, but um, did you write everything else? Yeah, um, uh, I did. Um, myself and Phil Thorn Alley. Um, Phil is a wonder, he, he produced the record and he's a, a, really a brilliant songwriter. Um, and between the two of us, um, it, you know, to, to be perfectly honest with you, a lot of times uh, I, I get stuck. Um, and whether it's on a, uh, on a chord change or on a lyric or on a production note or whether I should put a guitar solo in or, or change an arrangement, um, I can, uh, one of the, uh, one of the br most brilliant things Jim Steinman ever said to me was, um, I hate making a decision. It means the death of all possibilities. So, um, so I, yeah, I, I kind of subscribe to that school of thought where I just, I, I pain over a decision. Um, and Phil uh, helped me through those, uh, th those trying times and said, no, this is what we're doing. This is how you're doing it. No, I mean, not, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But, uh, but he really kind of gave me the little kick that I needed to get things finished and move on to something else. But more love, for instance, what, where were you at when you wrote that? So we had finished 11 songs on the record uh, and, uh, and we were getting ready to wrap things up and Phil called me and said, uh, we need one more song. Um, and we've got, you know, we've got enough ballads, we've got enough mid-tempo songs, we've got enough up-tempo songs, we've got enough aggressive stuff. Uh, we've touched this bass, that bass, that, this bass with lyr lyrically. So we kind of need something that's right down the middle, um, not too fast, not too slow, um, positive message. Uh, and then Phil came up with the idea for More Love. That was his, he brought the demo to me. And, and I said, okay, you know, the, this whole process of this entire record, this is the only other person that has produced an, an entire record for me uh, was Bruce Fairburn. And, uh, and I loved working with a fellow Canadian and I, I love working with Bruce, but that was in 1981. Um, I have worked with producers since then, but not on an entire project. Uh, so I really, um, I, I put my, my entire trust and faith in Phil and his vision of what the record should be. Um, so, so when he said we needed another song, one more song, I said, okay, you just, let's just come up, you come up with the idea and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. And so he came to me with the idea and then uh, we finished it together. He, um, he suggested Prairie Prince on drums. So Prairie plays drums on the track. And he also said, you know, he is a, he is a huge Utopia fan, Phil. And he said, you know, what about, uh, what about having John Siegler play bass on this? And, um, and I said, uh, you know, I, 
I'm sure. Why not? I, I, I love John. And were it not for John, my my trajectory might have been completely different because it was John leaving Utopia uh, in 1976 that led me to have to get that gig. Um, so my journey would have been completely different had John not left the band. Um, and, and so I called John and John said, of course, I'd love to play bass on the record. And um, and so that's how that song came about. The reason that uh, that I chose that for the first single the record company asked um, requested Fast Car, which is another song on the record for the first single. And I said, I don't know that that's the right choice. That's a real uh, great rocker. record. Yeah, but great record label. Deco is a wonderful label, very artist centric. They're great guys and they've done a fantastic job for me over the past two months promoting and putting this record out. Um, very, very supportive. And, and Charlie Calv and, uh, and everybody at, the, at Bruce and everybody at the, at the label are just fantastic. Um, so I but I said Fast Car is a good track, but more love really is indicative of what the rest of the record is like. So if, if someone hears more love and they say, oh, this is pretty good, then they're more at that. They will find that similar stuff on the rest of the record and not say, oh, this is nothing like that. You know, the rest of the record is nothing like that. So that's why I, I chose more love. Which, which brings me to sequencing of an album. And it's a question mm -hmm. I ask an awful lot of people. And I, you know, by the way, I'm pleasantly surprised by some of the people I'm interviewing. Um, uh, I just interviewed, you know, I know you play with Blue Oyster Cult, Albert Bouchard, mm -hmm. and I was pleasantly surprised by his new album. I'm going, and I asked him too. Uh, there's some really good music being put out by guys who have a few years on me. And I love yeah. that. I'm going, uh -huh. wow, you know, I just turned 61. Uh -huh. And as you can imagine, you start looking at the clock, you're going, well, you know, it's strange. I've been in radio 38 years. I'm doing the best work I've ever done. Uh -huh. I, I'm not afraid of artists when I talk to artists anymore. I mean, at 61, I know they they go to the bathroom too, you know, and, and you get better conversations out of that. You give a little bit, they give a little bit, but I'm sort of understanding from my point of view, the formula that I have to make, but I'm watching the clock. Uh -huh. I'm going 61, you know, anything could happen at any time. Yeah. And, and I still and I go, wow, I'm in this same body that I was. I heard you talking about when you were in your 20s with that long interview uh, a, a little while back where you talk about when, you know, when you joining Utopia, you were young and, you know, sometimes you're not comfortable in your body. You're learning all these things of kind of how this body suit works, what I do, what happens if I press this. What is it for you? I mean, this is great work. Were you able to listen to it objectively and say, eh, not bad, you know? Um, that's a good question. I, 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 um, I have a hard time listening to my own music, uh, especially on record. Uh, and it's not until a few years later that I'll go back. And, uh, and, and when I do listen to it, I remember where I was when I wrote it or what, what, what the recording was like or, um, or, or how, um, how my voice has changed over the years. Um, my, my, my second solo record, which I did in 2004, um, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a, a really, really good record. It's a really, uh, the songs might not be really strong and lyrically it might be kind of sophomoric, but, um, but it's got some really, really good music, music that I like. And, um, and so listening to this record uh, after, uh, after recording, uh, 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 producing and mixing and then mastering and then, you know, making sure that the sequence is correct, like that makes a difference these days. Um, sometimes really, that, I, I don't know anyone that puts a CD on uh, and listens to it from top to bottom. You just, you know, people just skip around and, uh, it, you know, attention spans are just so incredibly short these days. Um, we're, we live in, in the world of TikTok and, you know, and, and just scrolling, 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 swipe, 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 swipe. Um, so, so it's going to be a few years before I go back and, and listen to this record and, um, and not uh, think that I should have, you know, that guitar part should have been a little louder. That vocal should have been ducked a little bit. Um, I should have resung that that word. Um, or I wish I had changed that lyric. Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm on to the next. I'm, I'm yeah. constantly on to the next. Paul McCartney, you've probably heard this where he'd go, oh, you know, they talk about the Beatles and he'd say, oh, yeah, they were good. I, you know, I heard them on the background. They were a good little band. Yeah. <laughs> and he'd be in yeah. a restaurant. And for whatever reason, for that space of time, even though those songs have been played, I mean, I know you're, you're a fan as well. Everyone is. It's a reason why a lot of us do what we do. But, but there is that moment sometimes you're able to have a, a piece where you can listen to it objectively in spite of yourself. You know, mm. that's that thing. You know, I, I, I was doing a, an, an interview yesterday and, and I, I inevitably get the question asked. Uh, what, so what was it that made you decide to become a musician? And, and the answer is inevitably always the same. It's that I was on the couch in my parents' living room uh, watching Ed Sullivan show in February of 1964. And I saw that. I saw the Beatles. And I said, that's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Um, but come hell or high water by hook or by crook i am going to make a living at being a musician uh and i think that determination at nine years old really kind of solidified my uh, my my path and i, I you know I, i'm a very very lucky person i'm very blessed i've, I've had a tremendous career um do i sell millions of records no um have i worked with hundreds of artists yes Am I on hundreds and hundreds of records? Yeah. Um, so I, I have no complaints, believe me. Uh, uh, you know, it didn't work out exactly how I planned because I thought for sure that I could be in the Beatles. <laughs> so that didn't really, that didn't pan out. Um, but, uh, but I did wind up working with one of them. So I'm very happy about that. Which takes us to track two, Unsung. Um, yeah. You know, folks have a tendency when I used to be a, a, a sorry, but a, a music critic for quite a few years. And I usually only wrote about things I loved. I said, listen, I don't want to pan on people. I mean, their parents, I remember I wrote a thing on Michael Buble once and his father uh, got a hold of me and he says, Oh, thanks, man. That's great. And it reminded me again, I'm going, listen, I know people need to pan on things that are bad. I, I'm just not the guy who's going to do it, but uh -huh. unsung. I used to write this all the time going, you know, the artist is great, but let's check out this. This is a machine with many moving parts, as Don mm -hmm. Henley would say to the audience. You'd never know how what I mean, what it takes to build one of these things. Uh, and you've been one of those guys, you know, that 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 helped it get to where it needed to get. And you did the work. That's why you were in the room. But unsung is that your? Are you singing about your career? Yeah. Uh huh. Um, again, kudos to Phil Thornalley. Um, who well, I came in with the idea. I'm, a, I'm a big. Uh, by the way, I like Michael Bublé. I think he's great. Um, and, and I'm a big Sarah Bar Bareilles fan. And uh, and there was something about her uh, her song. I'm not going to write you a love song that paralleled uh, something in my life, w which happened 40 years ago. Um, and, and the the only hit that Utopia ever had was a song called Set Me Free that I wrote. Um, about getting out of a record contract and uh, wound up being a top 20 hit for the band. Uh, only The only top 20 hit the band ever had. Um, and Sarah Bareilles' I'm Not Gonna Write You a Love Song is about not writing a love song. The record company said, you need a love song for this record. So, um, so I like the tune. And what we do as musicians, Todd says this, uh, we're, I'm on tour with Todd right now. And he says this every night. He said, um, he said, hello. He wrote, hello, it's me. And he knew it was a good song because he stole it. Um, and it, and it, he says this to the audience. And if you haven't figured it out by now, that's what musicians do. We steal. Um, and depending on who we steal from, it means that whether the song is going to be really good or it's going to be not so good. Uh, he won't, he doesn't mention who he stole. Hello, it's me from, but, um, so, so I sat down to try to rewrite I'm Not Gonna like, Write You a Love Song. Um, and that's how I came up with the music for Unsung. Now, I brought the song into Phil and Phil said, oh, that's quite nice. That's very, very that's lovely. Um, and at that time, I was working on a television pilot along with my manager and uh, uh, a director by the guy, uh, name of uh, Michael Simon. 
um, who does, uh, he did all the VH1 storytellers uh, and a bunch of music videos. And uh, he, he directs a show called Ridiculousness uh, on cable TV. In any case, uh, we were writing this pilot. And, uh, and, and I said, you know, we need a, we need a theme song for the, uh, for the show. And, uh, and I mentioned it to Phil and he's, and he took my idea that was the Sarah Bareilles ripoff and, um, and came up with the idea of unsung. And then we co-wrote the lyrics for the song. And so it is very extremely autobiographical. The television pilot has turned into a podcast. Uh, it's a series podcast called unsung and it will be released in February of 2022. Um, there is already six episodes uh, in post-production right now, and it is a really, really cool um, uh, uh, show, series podcast that's based on my life with actors, and we'll see what happens. Blame someone else. Are you in the position, are you in the driver's seat of that person who says that, or do you do that as well? Now that's the pointed finger. That, that, that is a pointed finger at, at, at uh, I, I don't, excuse me, I don't necessarily like to mix music and politics, uh, but when we wrote that song, it was just such a ridiculously stupid, crazy time. Not that it's not any less crazy now, uh, but uh, we, we, we decided that, uh, you know, we wanted to call some people out on their, um, on their inability to accept responsibility for, you know, for the mess that they're making of our uh, society and world. Not that uh, we as, as, you know, as people are, are any less responsible, but, you know, you look to leaders for direction and for, you know, for positivity and, uh, and, and not to say, not my fault. I didn't have anything to do with that. That was the other guy, you know? So that's what blame some somebody else is about god kicked the stone that's very yeah. theatrical it's has a theatrical feel to it yeah and you laugh um, in it you have a little chuckle in it yeah I, I i mean that that was just something that you know uh it was a, a bit of humanness that uh that that we decided to keep in the uh in the final track because uh rather than make something perfect uh or as close to perfect as you can get uh we thought it was you know it was good just uh, yeah, just leave it. It's a mistake, but just leave it in. Um, and the song itself is, is is kind of like my that's my Michelle period, if you will. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's just uh, it, 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 you know when you're when you're writing for a record, when you're trying to make a, a well-rounded record, uh, you want to uh, you want to include as much uh, diversity, or at least I do as much diversity as possible. So that's where that song came from. It's just a little quirky little song, like, you know, something you might find on, I, I don't, I, I, any record by any artist. That's just a little, a little diversion. When I talked to, uh, thank God I looked his name up because all, when I talked to uh, Glenn Shorick of the Little River Band, their lead singer, uh -huh. I remember a few years before I learned that I was saying it wasn't Glenn Sherrock or it's Randy Bachman. It's not Randy Bachman, even though he doesn't seem to care. How many times has your name been butchered? You know, so many times that there are times when I don't correct people. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's not just my first name. It's my first and second name. So, um, so a lot of times, and this, I, I, I tell this story a couple of times when I was a child growing up, I, I grew up on Staten Island in, in New York City. And uh, I grew up around Tommy, Joey, Billy, Bobby, Charlie, Jimmy. Um, yeah. And Johnny. And um, those are when in Rome so, uh, names, because when you're there, that's what people name their kids. And right. So so at seven years old, I get to use the phone for the first time my mom says yes you can call your friend on the telephone and uh and I call up my friend Joey and I say and I, I, I hi this uh hi Joey's mom um this is Cassim is is Joey there who uh Cassim Catherine no Cassim Joey doesn't know any by that name anyone by that name goodbye and hangs up on uh, still to this day I'll never forget as long as I live 
So uh, I was I, I was kind of ostracized a little bit because there were no Kassams when when we were growing up in the early 60s in New York City. Um, now, maybe it's a different story. Uh, but but then it was it, it was uh, I got in more fights about my name. So to answer your uh, your I don't know if it was a question or not, but uh, it, it's it, it's frustrating because I get, I get called Kasim or Kasmin or uh, Kasim. Um, but uh, and then Sultan, they, they usually misspell my second name. They usually spell it S-U-L-T-A-N, but it's actually S-U-L-T-O-N. Um, and I kind of wonder, I kind of wonder if, if, if I was kind of um, somewhat hindered by having a different name and especially a, a Muslim sounding name. Um, but it is my name and, uh, and I'm stuck with it and I never changed it. So, uh, so, you know, while at, at one point I was, I cursed my dad for giving it to, to me. Uh, now I thank him because a lot of people say, man, that's a cool name. And once you hear my name and you know my history, you never forget it. Yeah. Speaking of your dad, you're, uh, when he told you, you have to go to school or, or get a job. At well, that you did, do, you did do some research. It's part of the product, man. It's, it's all part of the service. But when he told you that at that point, this is the part I forget because I was just listening to this interview just before. I always try to watch an interview with anyone I do just to sort of get a feel for them. Uh -huh. Just to say, okay, I'm not going to be able to ask him that. I always do anyway, but or whatever right. the, the thing is. Um, when he said that to you, was that around the Utopia time when it started or had it started? No, yet? I was I was 17 uh, at that time, I was 17 or 18. I, I may, maybe I was 18. Um or maybe, maybe even 19. I, I, I don't know. I was out of high school. Um, I had tried college for uh, a half a year. That didn't work. I was not a student. I, I just was, n I was never good in school. Um, and, uh, and he, uh, I was playing in bands. I mean, maybe I made, you know, 50 bucks here and 10 bucks there and 25 bucks here. Um, and he was, uh, and I was, you know, 18 or 19 years old. And he's like, it's time for you to get a job, you know? And if, if, if you're, if you're not in school and you don't have a job, we have a problem. Um, and, and I'm like, Ugh, you know, job. Oh no. Uh, I thought I had a job and that was to become rich and famous. Um, <laughs> still working on it. Uh, but, um, so, so I, uh, I, I, you know, just the stars aligned and, and the universe was kind enough to me to, um, to, uh, to afford me an opportunity that I parlayed into a career. Uh, but it, I was down to the wire. I was definitely on my, my dad's last nerves. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I started making more money than him. And, uh, and, and that was okay. That was okay for a minute. When you auditioned for that band, you were a guitar player and decided that you'd sell your guitar to be a bass player. Were they were they brothers you had said before? Were they brothers in that band? Yeah, yeah, the Rayo brothers. So um, so let me interrupt you for a second. So this is such a good story. And I've always, now and then I'll hear something and I'll go, no, no, we got to tell the story again because it's an important, uh, my wife used to sell two, $3 million houses. And one uh, day she looked at me, I said, how can you cold call, man? How can you do that? And she said, oh, no, 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 I changed my paradigm. I get paid for rejection. So I go uh -huh. in there and I, my, my, my paradigm's completely changed. Okay. But if you tell someone in music, part of the large part of the music industry, you're going to get rejected. You're going to be humiliated. And if you yeah. get shamed in any way, you'll make sure that never happens again. All those beautiful mother statement lessons. But um, so t tell us that story about playing with those, those brothers. I mean, I was about 13 years old and I was in uh, at 13. I think you're in middle school. Yeah. So I was in the eighth grade. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, just uh, halfway through the or all, almost all the way through all the way through the eighth grade. And um, and these uh, I, I, I Staten Island, New York at, at that time was a very, very rural place. It was uh, mostly woods. Uh, and, and mom and pop stores and drive-in movie theaters. Um, uh, it, it, yeah. And just, uh, 
about as far from a, a city as you can get while still living in the city. They started um, developing Staten Island because uh, as cities do, they spread and, um, and they started putting up row houses in Staten Island. And, uh, and then they built the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which connected Brooklyn to Staten Island. And all the, uh, the, the masses of people in Brooklyn that prior to that had to take a ferry to get to Staten Island. Um, now there was a bridge. So you had this mass influx of, uh, of people from Brooklyn, which was a crowded borough, to Staten Island, which was kind of like living in the country, it, it, but st yet still in the city. So about three blocks from where uh, my, my folks' house is, they started putting up these row houses, which is like the ha same house after house after house after house. And it was all these people from Brooklyn that moved in. And these kids, these brothers, the, the Rayo brothers, John and, and, and Robert Rayo, um, were guitar players. They, they, they wound up in the same school as me. Did they get a um, reputation for being good pretty fast? Yeah, were they out there? Yeah. Uh -huh. they, were, they were hot shot guitar players. And, and, and they also dressed very well. So, um, so the, 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 the younger brother was in the same grade as me. And, uh, you know, when you're when you're in the eighth grade, you, you hang out with similar people with similar interests and likes. And uh, and he said, oh, you're a musician. Well, you know, we're starting a band, me and my brother, my older brother, Bobby. Um, and, uh, and would you you know, would you consider being in our band? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, and uh, he said, uh, OK, I said, I play guitar. He said, well, we don't need a guitar player. We need a bass player. And um, I said, oh, well, um, OK, let me uh, see what I can do about that. I went home. I asked my dad if I could sell the guitar that he bought me a couple of Christmases before. Uh, and I bought a bass guitar and uh, I, I, I slapped together some amplifiers and, uh, and wound up in, in the band with the Rayo Brothers. About maybe six, eight months later, um, this guy, John, Buzzy, Buzzy Verno, um, came into the picture. And, and as well as these guys, as the Rayo brothers dressed, the Verno brothers, they, they, they shopped at Granny Takes a Trip, Trash and Vaudeville. Um, they had money to burn in, in high school. Uh, and and they, they looked like rock stars. Uh, and this is in... 10th grade of, of high school um, or ninth grade, whatever. Anyway, long story even longer, um, John was a bass player and had an amplifier and they fired me because they wanted Buzzy Verno to come in and play bass because he had a brand new amplifier and I didn't have an amplifier. Well, at 14 years old, I went home and I, I, I to this day, I remember remember it like it was yesterday walking home the three blocks from their house with my bass guitar uh and crying and when i got home i cried my eyes out to my mom and said that they fired me because i didn't have an amplifier and i will show them i'll i'll, I'll show them that they made a big mistake firing me um i'm still friendly with those guys today unfortunately buzzy verno passed away about a year ago uh, John, uh, the younger uh, brother, uh, is, uh, he's, not a, he's still a musician, but he didn't, never made a career out of it. The older brother never made a career out of music. I'm the only one that became successful. Um, and uh, yeah, I showed them. Well, that, yeah, that lights, you know, there's, you know, the, 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 my father used to tell me the old story, you know, oh, everyone goes off to war, son and father out in the field, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, father says, I can't make it without you. Uh, and in the middle of nowhere, he breaks, the son breaks his leg, he can't go to war, and he's feeling bad. And everyone on that plane gets killed, son, leg gets better. You know, all those cliche yeah. stories that you put in there of going, well, you know, there's a meeting and... Um, but... Hey, listen, you know, I, I, I have to tell you, if, I, if they hadn't fired me, um, and if I hadn't gone home and, and, and with, with all that determination, the same, the same level of determination that, that, that I had, if not more, when, when I watched that Ed Sullivan show 
um, I was just like, I'm, I, I'm going to get really good at, at this instrument and, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to show them, I'm going to show them and myself that I can do this and God damn it. You know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about set me free. I mean, the, here's a band that when I was in, introduced to Utopia, I remember going, then you did, you did that, uh, that, uh, that tribute, you know, you take all the, the, this is based on these songs and it's the Beatles. And I remember going, what an ingenious, I mean, God, I would have never thought of that, you know? Um, so when I was digging a little deeper into the band, cause I was more familiar with his solo work as I was to Utopia. And then that's just a whole freaking other world. Yeah. And the fact that Utopia was a democratic band was cool that you guys all sang, uh -huh. you know, um, what was the feeling for you going into that band where you, you, and I know Todd didn't want you in the beginning. And then some bandmates said, well, so what was your reaction when, how did you find out he didn't want you in the beginning? Um, he made it abundantly clear <laughs> that, that, uh, that he was doing Roger and Willie a favor by having me in the band and, and was fully prepared for me not to work out. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was only 20 years. I just turned 20. Uh, and, um, and I had never been, recorded uh, a, a, a proper record before i've been in the recording studio i was a, i was a tape op and an assistant engineer um and, and worked in many recording studios uh in new york city um but uh i'd never been on the road before i mean my my road uh experience was in a van up to connecticut uh, to the berkshires to play at the red lion uh, with Charlie Vanilla, um, or down to the Jersey Shore for uh, you know the odd one-off um, in some dive bar in Asbury Park. Uh, so I had never, I had never been on a plane. Um, but that and, first album, uh, here you are, you're writing in Utopia. That, that just you, like you hit the ground running. You're singing. You're, you're yeah. Well, um, we would you know. I mean, I mean, it was it, it was a conscious decision on Todd's part that at that point in the in, in the the evolution of Utopia that it was going to be a democratic band that everybody was going to have a hand in creating a record uh, and writing the material for the record and. Uh, and, uh, you know, to his credit, I, I mean, that was uh, I was definitely thrown in the deep end of the pool and had to learn how to swim really fast. Well, I was I talked to Joey Mulland of uh, Badfinger a, a while ago and he was talking about, you know, he had friction and in love for Todd, you know, when mm -hmm. working with them. And uh, and you get those kind of reactions where Todd seems like a guy who doesn't suffer fools. Was he the type of guy that would come up to you and say, yeah, we're not including that song? It was democratic, but was there must have been times no. someone brought it. No, no. And, and no. And I'll tell you that that's really interesting. That's a very interesting never been asked before. And I think that's a very, very interesting question, because I think that. Uh, that and I, you know I'm just musing here, but I I I I believe that Todd's attitude is, you know, it's not for me to make the judgment call uh, uh, on 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 anyone and anyone's contribution. What my job is, and this is just in the confines of Utopia. This is completely just within the confines of that four piece band. So Todd wasn't wasn't going to make a judgment call on any one person's contribution. What he was going to do was be a band member and take that contribution and put his uh, his take on it too. you know, it, uh, it contribute as one quarter of a band, which is very interesting, actually. Very, very interesting, because Todd is one of the most brilliant songwriters I've ever known or worked with. And uh, he. Uh, as a lyricist, I, I don't. I think he's one of the one of the top lyricists of the second half of the twentieth century. Um, and, and I mean, just to see him sit down. We had recorded uh, a, a song called "Love Is the Answer," and uh, we were working on the basic track. Uh, and he uh, he came in with the uh, with a, a composition notebook and half an hour. He's the, the song is written. The, the lyrics are written for love is the answer. So what a song that is. Yeah, it's, nice. a, it's a beautiful song. Well, I first heard it with England, Dan and John. England, Dan and John. Not Polly, knowing, yeah. not knowing. That it was uh, a utopia song. 
Yeah. Was there ever a criteria for Utopia of going, we're just four guys who are going to write songs? Uh, um, that, that uh, Set Me Free appeared on Adventures in Utopia, which was like, we did that in 1979 and, um, or 70. 78? I don't know. Something like that. Might have been 79 uh, released. I think it was a hit in, in 1980. Wasn't yes, it? you are correct. Yes. Um, so so it was right after uh, Oops, Wrong Planet. And Todd uh, said, you know what you know would be interesting um, is if we listen, if we take the uh, Billboard Hot 100 the, the, for the last 10 weeks and and look at let's look at the number one songs on the Billboard Hot 100 singles, uh, see what what has been a hit and uh, and see if we can if we can best that. Um, so so we set about trying to write songs that were similar to uh, to songs that were that were chart toppers uh, uh, at that particular moment in time. Um, Hence, uh, um, uh, the song, uh, one of the songs, um, Very Last Time. Uh, at, that, uh, at that time, it, it, um, Boston's uh, More Than a Feeling was, uh, was number one. And if you listen to um, Very Last Time and More Than a Feeling back to back, uh, you can, I can see the similarities. Set Me Free was an interesting song because... Um, when I when I joined the band, when I joined Utopia, uh, uh, Todd's record com uh, contract with Bearsville Records was expired and they, they wanted Todd to resign. And to his credit, Todd said, OK, I will resign with Bearsville Records, but you also have to resign Utopia and you have to resign each individual member of Utopia to a solo contract. And Albert Grossman much to our chagrin, um, reluctantly said yes. And, uh, and I was, I, I, I could not have been happier I'm, uh, and because I, I had a recording contract. And, uh, and that's really what I really, really wanted. I really wanted to do a solo record. As much as I love playing in the band, I wanted to do my own record and my own music. Um, so I set about writing uh, demos, doing demo work and, and submitting them. And I would get the same answer from Albert. No, you're not ready. No, you're not ready. No, nah, this is not that great. No, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. Got to the point where I said, look, you know, I've, now I've got 20 demos here. I, I said, you can't find anything good in any one of them. Uh, then let me out of the contract. Let me go somewhere else. Let me, uh, you know, uh, research or, or, or go to other labels and see if they're interested in signing me. And he said, OK, um, you can go do that. And uh, so I got some interest from EMI America and uh, and I went back to Albert and I said, I, I, I'd like to be released from my recording contract so I can sign with another label. And he said, absolutely, you can. He said, that will be $50,000 and 15 points on your next record. Uh, and I said, uh, wait a second, hold, let me get this straight. So you haven't done anything with me. I've done some demos in the studio, uh, but it certainly I haven't used my $50,000. Uh, and, and why would you get 15% of my next record from, from doing nothing? And I was told that that was business. And... Uh, and that's that, that's a, a tough lesson to learn at 23 years old. So I sat down and in 20 minutes, I wrote Set Me Free and uh, at my folks house and uh, and demoed it up and brought it to the band. And they're like, eh, OK, this is a this is a pretty good song. Um, if were it not were it not for Todd's. Uh, production and Roger's uh, um, ideas for, you know, uh, counterpoint melodies and, and Willie's drumming. Um, uh, I don't know that it would have been as successful. Um, it really, it really took a village to make that song the, 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 the hit that it was, but uh, it, that song, it was about getting out of a record deal. You know, uh, with uh, what it means to be alone, uh, uh, which is, I think, the most beautiful song on the album. 
I spent a lot of years being alone and I like people who have spent a lot of time years alone and I like people who write about it and I like books about it. And, and there's, uh, it, it's not the whole room. It's a section of the room in your life. You know, um, is that autobiographical for you? You know, I, I, uh, I, I said, uh, both Phil and I said about, uh, set out to write a song that was kind of, um, uh, in a current vein, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, um, I, I don't want to say house music or EDM or, you know, or anything like that. It's just, uh, uh, it, it's a little attempt at, 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 at trying to, to remain current, not, uh, um, but at the same token, stay true to, to my artistic uh, uh, values uh, in terms of, of, of song composition and, and production. Um is it autobiographical? No, I don't like being alone. I, I do not. I, I like being around people. Well, there's um, some love songs that are coming up there. We're going to talk about that. So I got yeah. a feeling I'm going, it, I, I kept thinking if he, if he was alone, then he certainly doesn't seem like he's alone now based on the songs that are coming up on the album. No, I, 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 gra- I, I like being around people. And um, I, 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 it's not that I have a hard time being alone, but um, it, given the choice, I would rather be, I'd rather be with someone, yeah. uh, it, b- w- whether it's a friend or, you know, a girlfriend or uh, what, you know, it doesn't matter. I like being I like being around people. But then again, <laughs> I don't mind being alone every now and then, every now and then I'm alone right now. So there you go. What was the experience like? Was to me, that was a bit of a different album t- than the other ones. Uh, what was the experience like working on that album with Todd? Neil Human? Yeah. Um, I only worked on one track on that record, uh, and um, and the way that I remember it, uh, and maybe some other people would remember it differently. But um, I, I I was playing with Joan Jett at the time, um, and uh, and I heard that Todd was doing a record with a bunch of other musicians. Um, I happened to be in San Francisco with Joan. Uh, and I had called someone, whether it was Todd or I, I don't know who, who, who or where I made the phone call. And I said, uh, I'm going to be in San Francisco, uh, any chance that I could play on a track. Uh, and he said, uh, he said, yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be, uh, in the studio and I will, um, I'll, 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 I'll put, I'll put you in for this particular song that we're doing at that time period. Um, and I was the one that suggested that Roger and Willie also play on that track. So both Roger Powell and Willie Wilcox are on uh, Can't Stop Running. I believe that's the song. Yeah. Great tune. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know where I put it. Oh, oh, geez. I don't usually pull out album covers, but uh, <laughs> like, yeah. holy snapping turtles. They uh-huh. misspelled your name on this, right? Yeah. T-A-N. Yeah, my name is misspelled more. Uh, my name is is on that record more than Meatloaf's. So uh, I, I uh, but it's You're responsible for any of this this stuff going on I here. Am, I, what, I, listen, I what's going on here? The only thing I'm responsible for on that record is 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 is, is helping with the arrangements and the bass playing on the entire record, which you know, uh, in terms of. What you know? What are some of the highlights of your musical career? I think playing on one of the biggest selling records of all time um, is a feather in one's cap. Um, you know, I, I mean, I have tons of friends who have played on millions of records, but not too many people have played on Dark Side of the Moon, Thriller. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a, a Hotel California or Bat Out of Hell, and then or Falling Into You. Um, so there were like five or six uh, records that, uh, uh, in, in throughout the course of uh, the record recorded music that have sold that many records, and Bat Out of Hell is one of them, and I'm the bass player on that record, so there you go. To me, it's kind of like when I heard Carry On Wayward Son by Kansas or Bohemian Rhapsody by, by Queen. And I was a Queen album, you know, a Queen fan. I had the first the debut album, Sheer Heart Attack. But by the time, and then I hear that and I'm like turning around uh, and saying, what the heck? Um, but to me, Bad Out of Hell was not, I wouldn't have picked, I would have been wrong, but I wouldn't have picked 
that album is being a hit album. And but it, to me, that was a good example of people at least widening their horizons a little bit and saying there's more to radio than this. You know, I, I mean, they got kicked out. Jim and Meatloaf got kicked out of Clive Davis's office. That uh, Clive said, you, you guys, you, you should go find something else to do in life because you are never going to be successful. Um, and that's, you know, Clive Davis, who, uh, you know, has, has a, a really good ear. Um, you know, to his credit, Todd heard something in that music that no one else or very few people did. Um, and took it and created something or helped create something. It was really Jim and Todd uh, that, uh, that, that, that really envisioned that record the way it, the way it is. Um, and, uh, you know, and now there's, uh, there's uh, you know, everybody uh, uh, is responsible for the success of Bad Out of Hell. You know, it's like I, there was a, when Jim Steinman passed away, there was a Facebook post by someone who I, I know. Um, and he was lamenting the fact that Jim had passed and remembered his work on Bad Out of Hell 1. The guy was never anywhere near the freaking record. Um, so there, what, what is the, what's the, what's the phrase? Um, uh, 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 success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, everybody's the first one to say, yeah, I did this on that. Right. I did that on that record. I was in the studio when they did this. I was at, no, sorry. Um, there was four of us that recorded the basic tracks for that record from top to bottom. It was myself, Todd, Max Weinberg and Roy Bitten. And, uh, and then a lot of people came in and did overdubs and background vocals, Rory Dodd and Ellen Foley on background vocals. Myself, I, I did some background vocals. Todd sang some backgrounds. Meat was, uh, was delegated to the corner until it was time for him to sing. And then we said, okay, you can sing now. Um, and, uh, and, but it was really Jim and, uh, and Todd that, that put that whole concept, that whole record together. And, um, and it just resonated with with uh, with millions and millions of uh, of disenfranchised people who did not want to uh, or didn't fall into the category of um, well at that time there was no John Bon Jovi but um, you know the 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 idea of what uh, uh, the music industry was selling as uh, as a beautiful rock star successful rock star was completely the antithesis of that like building a song like you know paradise by the dashboard like to me like oh my god like i remember my first reaction was like what my, who would have thought of that well jim, jim is a bit well, jim was a big baseball fan jim was a huge fan, and, and to his credit so was meatloaf but uh but jim you know jim had the concept for we're going to do a play-by-play -play in the middle of this song and we're going to have have it uh, um, you know, a metaphor for being in the backseat of a, it's brilliant, you know, being in the backseat of, of, of a car at the lake with your, uh, with your girlfriend or with your high school girlfriend, uh, girlfriend. Um, and it just worked, you know. One more thing about that. I know that you had said in a previous interview that, so they, so Todd calls you just, and you said, he just said, come on down here. You got to come down here. No, 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 no. He called me. I was I was living with Roger Powell up in Woodstock mm -hmm. um, and Todd had had agreed to do this production and uh, they didn't have a band. Uh, Jim knew that he wanted Roy Bitten and Max Weinberg from the E Street Band because the music in his mind uh, mirrored uh, Bruce in, in, in a way. Um, and uh, but he they, they didn't have a bass player and they didn't have a guitar player. So, of course, Todd played guitar. And me being in, in proximity to uh, to the recording studio and the rehearsing, and and at that point, I, I was six months about six months into the band, and I had kind of proven myself as a worthy um, uh, uh, addition. So Todd called me and said, "You want to play bass on a record?" Uh, which you know, even even now, it's funny. It's funny. I'm thinking about it now, and and. Uh, I'm like, he wouldn't have asked me to play if he didn't think I was any good. I always say, man, you got to do the work to get in the room. You know, you do have to do the work to get in the room. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one last thing, uh, when you yeah. went down and Ellen Foley was there and 
Meat mm-hmm. was there and they played, they went through the whole album for you guys, yes. right? Yeah, they, they played the entire album from top to bottom. I'll never forget my, I, I, was, I was in Woodstock and I was with my, my, my wife then. And, um, and we sat there and listened to them. Uh, uh, Jim played piano and uh, Meatloaf sang and Rory Dodd, who was a fellow Canadian and Ellen Foley, um, uh, the Paradise Girl. They, they not only sang everything, all the background vocals and all the, uh, all the parts that they heard, um, but they also acted it out. They acted out Paradise by the Dashboard Light in the accountant's office that we were on the second floor of the accountant's office in Bearsville Records um, at a little upright piano. And it was a trip. It was a real, I wish somebody would have filmed that. That's crazy. I had no idea about that part. They acted, they yeah. had it down. They had it down at, at least yeah. the theatrical. Oh, wow, it's crazy. One of my favorite artists, um, not only because of his songs, because I like the, his unique way of singing is Paul Williams. How do you work <laughs> with Paul Williams? He just sings. No one sounds like, I can tell Paul Williams when he's singing. I mean. Talk about highlights. Uh, um, Paul and I uh, started wor- working together. We are uh both, uh, I, I, I don't have to b- worry about breaking his anonymity because he, he is, uh, he's very vocal about it. Uh, both Paul and I are in long-term recovery and uh, um, we, we were involved in a project that uh, was raising awareness for um, the 15 million people in this country that are in long-term recovery and dealing with uh, and helping other people with substance abuse and uh, substance abuse and addiction issues. Um, Paul was was uh, contacted by the uh, by this gentleman by the name of Greg Williams, who put this whole show together that we did in 2014 in Washington D.C. Um, and it was a trip. We we wrote a song together along with people in the recovery community. Um, and, uh, and so Paul and I, uh, came up with, um, with this track called, um, uh, the voice of change and, uh, yeah, it was just really cool. Paul and I are, 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 are good friends and man, I, he's, he's amazing. He is a really, really amazing person. And I am proud and honored to call him a friend. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to tell us a story about, so you're backstage and you look up and there's Todd talking to two people, Paul and Linda, then you know what you have to do at that point. Yeah. I I mean, I had, you know, I, yeah, I had met one Beatle prior to that. Um, Who? I I, I met John. Um, Just happenstance. I was going to an audition with Peter Brown, um, who was then the president of RSO Records. And uh, I, I'd somehow gotten into uh, uh, playing him some demo tapes. Uh, um, and I, I, I was on 72nd Street walking to this, uh, to this meeting. And, uh, and I just saw two people window shopping and they looked vaguely familiar, and um, it was John and Yoko. Uh, I passed by, and I said, I have to go, I have to turn around. And so I turn around, I go back, and I just said, excuse me, I, um, I beg your pardon, but I just wanted to say that I'm a huge fan, and I really, I, I really think you're great. And I shook his hand, and that was it. I didn't push it any further than that. I, I, I wanted to respect his space, um, and, uh, he was very kind. Had I known at that time that Peter Brown was the gentleman who brought Brian Epstein to the Cavern Club um, it, it, to see the Beatles in 61 or something like that. Or, yeah, I guess it was 61 or 62. Um, I might have said, by the way, I'm, I'm on my way to see Peter Brown. I'll tell him you said hi. And maybe I would have struck up a conversation with him. But uh, it doesn't matter. I, I, I shook his hand and he was very gracious. Um, years later, I'm at Nebworth in London and I see Todd, we're backstage, the Rolling Stones were playing, we were playing with the Rolling Stones 
And um, we had already been, uh, we had already done our set. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. It's ridiculously hot, middle of August. And, um, and I see Paul, uh, I, I see a Todd Rundgren in the, in the big catering tent and he's sitting with Paul and Linda. And I, I you know, I have to be introduced. Um, and I, 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 you know, I'm not a pushy person. I'm really, really not. And, uh, but at that particular moment, I really, I just wanted to shake his hand and say hi. And so I went over to Todd and I whispered in his ear. I said, if you don't introduce me to Paul and Linda right now, I'm going home. Um, so, and we still had other gigs to do. So he said, Paul, this is Cass. I'm on bass player. And it's like, oh, hi, please me. I sat down, Todd split. And I sat down and I spent about 20 minutes talking to him and Linda. And they could not have been sweeter and nicer and just lovely, lovely people. And you had said that one of your friends ran into him and he yeah. mentioned you. Just can yeah. you share that? That's amazing. He'd remember. Sure. Well, Roger, uh, Roger Powell was um, was playing with David Bowie at the time. He was he was on tour with David Bowie uh, during a break in Utopia. And he was on the Concord, took the Concord over uh, or, or back from England. Uh, and um, and Paul was on the flight. And uh, he said hello to Paul. And Paul said, oh, by the way, do you still have that lovely young man who's your bass player? And uh, Ryder said, yeah. He says, please tell him I said hi. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty good. So did you open, what circumstances did you open for Zeppelin? Or did I read that wrong? Yeah, so the next year we played, or was it the next weekend? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I know we played two years in a row. Uh, at Nebworth, um, but we did do two weekends in a row at Nebworth, uh, I think in 78. Uh, well, uh, so in 70, 77, I don't know, you, you're the research maven. So in 77, we played with the Rolling Stones or, or 70, uh, 78, we played with the Rolling Stones. In 79, we played with Led Zeppelin. It was one of the last shows that John Bonham did with the band. Everything I should want is was that pointed at someone that beautiful no i mean it's just a tongue-in-cheek uh you know thing about we always think we want something but then when we get it it's like what you know i shouldn't have asked i should not have asked i should have been a little bit more specific in the ask well you know the cliche everything you love about them in the beginning is what breaks you up at the end so yeah Oh, I love this. In the name of love, track 10, because see, we're uh -huh. almost done the album. You're going to kill me in the name of love. Damn yeah. catchy song, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know, it's uh, 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 life is certainly a, 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 a funny journey. Uh, and it takes us to places that we don't necessarily want to go, but maybe have to go. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's that's the great thing about being an artist and a songwriter and a singer is that we get to express ourselves in something as beautiful as music. Are you surprised that Todd's not, not was not interested in going to the rock and roll hall of fame? I wasn't surprised when I heard it because I'd heard what he'd said about it, but no. And, and when, when Mellencamp got on there, not Mellencamp, uh, uh, um, Paul and Oates. uh, no, it was, uh, what was from, uh, Steve Miller. Oh. You know, and I'm going, people are so scared of these institutions, right? They're, oh, I might not ever get in. And um, I forget who the artist was who was saying bad things about them. And the following year he got in, it wasn't Todd, it was somebody else. Um, people are just scared of these huge monolithic, what seems like institutions. And they, they but then you'll get an artist who will speak their mind and say, well, yeah, you know, that's not my thing. Uh -huh. Um. You know, I think Todd's attitude is uh, is like we spoke about earlier in the phone uh, in the in the interview, which is I don't do this to make you happy. Um, if you get happiness from what I do, then that's great. Then that, that's wonderful. But I do it to make myself happy. And in doing that, I hope that other people enjoy it as well. Um, the thing, the whole thing about uh, the Rock Hall is, uh, it, you know, and I, I, I I'll I'll say it. Um, it's always nice to be recognized by your peers and acknowledged. Um, but I don't think that Todd relies on that to complete himself. Oh, Nick Lowe. Yeah. You record the last track. Yeah. Um, was that, that, that is one of those songs that that's an earworms. I mean, that's just 
classic. yeah i mean i you know i uh i like to do a uh, cover song every now and then um i always like i for whatever reason i i like to uh do at least one cover song on a record uh my my second solo album uh that i i did in 2004 quid pro quo um i did a harry milson song on it and i also did a a, 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 a finn brothers song on that record as well uh, my last record before this last one, um, I did a George Gershwin song. I did so, um, Someone to Watch Over Me mm -hmm. uh, for that record. And then this one, uh, uh, both Phil and I thought, you know, uh, let's let's try to pick a, a, a cover song that's a little current that has something to do with uh, the, uh, the, the, the societal landscape um, and with a positive message. And uh, uh, Phil suggested... Uh, what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? And I said, "Great, let's do that one." Radio show. Yeah. Tell us about your radio show. Um, I have a radio show on terrestrial radio every um, every Sunday night at seven p.m. I'm also on in three other markets. Uh, um, so the the show debuted uh, on a Woodstock station called uh, Radio Woodstock WDST one hundred point one on your FM dial. It's also on uh, online at w at radiowoodstock.com. We're also in um, Roanoke, Virginia, Lake Charles, Louisiana, uh, and now uh, we're uh, we're on a Texas station. Um, it, it's called It's My World, and welcome to it. It's an hour of. Uh, of really diverse music, stuff that I listen to, new stuff. Um, I, I do a little bit of history on, on the show. Like I'll talk, uh, uh, I'll do a little talking about where the song comes from, what's what's behind the songs, uh, working with artists. I, every so often I'll do an interview. Um, and I just love that the fact that I have a radio show. I grew up on radio. Uh, when I was when I was a kid, my my folks had the radio on in the kitchen from, uh, you know, 7 a.m. until 11 p.m. Um, and, and we listened to the radio all the time. So now I have a radio show and I'm very, very proud of it. It's my world and welcome to it. Seven, 7 p.m. Sunday nights on RadioWoodstock.com. I know you love playing with Hall & Oates. Yes, I loved working with Daryl and John. Um, was a, 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 a real highlight. The best part about that was not only because I'm a, I'm a Daryl and John fan, um, uh, and I've known them, we, we used to do gigs together in the 70s, uh, Utopia and Hall and & Oates, um, oddly enough. And, um, but when I worked with Daryl and John, um, there were two other guys in the band who are no longer with us. One was uh, the keyboard player, Bobby Mayo, who uh, played organ and piano in the band and one of uh, i i can't even I, is this bob mayo not, from from frampton yes yeah yeah uh I, I i i could not even find words to describe what a brilliant musician bobby mayo uh was and uh did you meet him yeah. did you meet him there yes yeah i did i met him at, at with daryl and john and the other musician that was in the band at the same time with me was uh, T-Bone Wolk. And T-Bone, as a bass player and as a human being, was just, uh, just I, I am so, so incredibly lucky to have known and worked with those two guys that, uh, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm a really, I'm blessed and a very, very lucky guy. You know, when uh, 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 Caleb Quay and Roger Pope left the Elton John band when they were fired, I think they got a good settlement or whatever. But uh, when they left and ended up playing with Hall & Oates in the mid-70s, um, I can't speak for Roger because Roger, I never got a chance to meet him, though I know his, his widow, Sue. But Caleb said it was a, just a hoot. It was just, he just yeah. loved, loved playing with them so much. I loved, I loved working with Daryl and John. I really did. The, the music is just, you know, uh, the, the songs. And at that time, you know, that was the, the late late eighties, early nineties, and they were just firing on all cylinders. And uh, it was a, a, it was a really fun time. His new album is Casim 2021. You can pick it up via the links in the description of this video. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel and share our videos, links to the podcast and video to this interview in the description. Remember that. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Book.